Hello and welcome to episode 24 of my 59th minute FPL podcast. I'm the FPL general coming to you today on, I'm recording on Jan, Tuesday, January the 15th. So I was all set up to record about an hour ago, made my notes, you know, made myself a nice cup of tea, just about to hit the record button and then a tweet pops up, Trent Alexander-Arnold ruled out for four weeks and I'm lucky the laptop's still working to be honest to record this podcast because I was very close to throwing it out the window when I seen that tweet. So I made a I made a rare early transfer this week, um, had two frees. Um, got tired of Alonso, so Sunday night, booted, booted him out of my team and brought in Alexander-Arnold. Trent was going to rise in price this week, Alonso was going to drop. I said, it's a low-risk week to make an early move because there's no midweek games. And lo and behold, I'm sitting here on Tuesday now uh, with an injured player who I've just brought in. So absolutely, you know, very, very, very frustrating, but I only have myself to blame at the same time. So... And on top of that, then I'm coming down with a cold today, so apologies if I sound a little bit sniffly on this one, but I'll try and remain upbeat if I can. So I'm going to look ahead to game week 23. Um, going to do a quick review of 22. Uh, it was another red arrow for me. Update the watch list, uh, take a few questions from Twitter, and then talk about captaincy and transfers for, for the upcoming weekend. So first of all, the 59th minute shout-outs. There, there was none this week, actually. Nobody nobody got the dreaded 59th minute substitution. Uh, a couple of notable mentions uh, for players who managed 58 minutes. Uh, Diego Jota at Wolves and Unai Emery made a, a double 58 minute substitution as well, bringing off Shaka and Mustafi. So hopefully next week we'll have a, have a few 59th minute shout outs. Uh, th- thanks to everyone who tweets those into me as well. You know, whenever there is a, a substitution around that 59th minute, because it, it saves me going looking for them then. So a quick review of game week 22. Um, as I said, another red arrow. So I banked, banked my transfer going into the weekend. Uh, I held off on bringing Salah back in just for one more week. So I, I, I kept faith in Hazard, captained Hazard again uh, for the second week running and, and pretty disappointing again just to get an assist from him. So, you know, selling Salah before Christmas was uh, has obviously been very punishing, but it's the captaincy really which is has been the worst because you know Salah's Salah's delivered um, probably four out of five weeks uh, when most people are captaining him, and my captains have been pretty weak. Uh, I captained Hazard three times, um, and I think I've only had one captaincy haul since I've sold Salah. So you know, I really need to get Salah back in, and, and it's going to just be auto captain Salah for me now for the next couple of weeks, and and try and start climbing again. So Hazard captain disappointing. It was the f- as I said, it's the fourth red arrow in the last five weeks. So since I've sold Salah, it's been four red arrows in five, um, and I've dropped now to two hundred and seventy k overall. So I think I was about one hundred and thirty six k before Christmas, and it's it's two hundred and seventy k now. So you know around double of of where it, where I was. Um, but still, top fifty, top fifty k is still my target, and and it's still it's still well achievable. And um, just need to play the second second half of the season as as well as I can. And um, obviously, that the early transfer for Trent is a is a bad start, but hopefully that won't be too damaging. And I'll talk more about uh, what I'm going to do later when it, when it comes to transfers. So fi- it was fifty three points. The only players who did anything really where Fabianski so glad I held on to Fabianski I know a lot of people sold him um, I probably would have sold him myself if I didn't have other you know other issues uh, Robertson again he's just been uh, immense this season another nine pointer and Sani good to get eight points from Sani in the game last night although when Wolves got a, an early red card I was kind of hoping that it would be more than you know just an assist uh, for, for Sani but it was good good that he got the two bonus points can't you know can't argue with that a couple of negatives. Uh, Roberto Perea, Perea, Watford. I brought him in three weeks ago. I think he's got me five points in three weeks. So he's been an absolute disaster. Um, I, w- I was watching match of the day. Uh, I didn't actually watch match today until yesterday, uh, from the weekend, and I didn't realize Perea had hit the post. Uh, I just I don't know how he missed. Uh, Delafeu hit the post, and then from the rebound, Perea hit the post as well. And again, watching match of the day, I was. 
I was, you know, I was lucky that the remote control wasn't thrown at the TV. Watching Pereira hit the post, it was basically an open goal. You know, I don't know how he missed it. Uh, Richarlison as well. For this, I think it's the second week in a row he's had a shot somehow cleared off the line. Uh, so very frustrating, another blank from Richarlison. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy enough to hold on to him because the fixtures are good there. Uh, I, I know I had a question on Twitter from Jason who was asking about Richarlison. He was saying, do we sell him? Or do we hold them because the fixtures are good and there's a lack of options around the same price? So I am quite happy to hold on to him and hopefully hopefully his luck's going to turn as well um, and he stops getting balls cleared off the line. Uh, another positive was Juan Bissaka. He, he really is the special one. Conceded two goals, no attacking returns and he gets three bonus points. So that was a, that was a nice bonus, a four-pointer. In a two-one defeat with no attack and returns, you can't really ask for much more than that. He, again, he's. It just looks like we need to play him most weeks now because he, he's capable of, capable of that. Um, with with uh, Alexander in, Alexander Arnold injury now, uh, if I decide to keep Trent, I'm probably going to have to play Juan Vasaka against Liverpool, uh, which is not ideal because you know I'm going to bring in Salah and, and more than likely captain Salah. So you know I'm hoping for a big a big haul from Mo, but. You know, Juan Bissaka, you never know in that game. He even if they do concede a couple of goals, he could pick up a bonus point again. So it might not be the end of the world having to play him against Liverpool. So that is my game week two summed up. Again, another frustrating one, but hopefully now uh, going forward things can improve. Moving into the watch list update now. So I've got five players, five or six players here I'm going to mention. Uh, again, this week I'm going to talk about the players I've added to the watch list after you know watching the highlights from from Game Week 22 and looking at the stats and things like that. The first player is Deli Ali, priced 8.9 million. His ownership is at just 2.9 percent. Spurs have great fixtures. Um, Ali, I watched the United Spurs game. Great game to watch as a Man United fan. It felt like. It felt like the old days when Fergie was there. It was that kind of performance. Um, a great win uh, at Wembley. And, uh, you know, the United assets are great now. I'll talk about those in a little while as well. But back back to Deli Alley. He, he caught the eye in that game. He had a lot of chances. Both him and Harry Kane had a lot of chances. And they were denied by a, an excellent performance from David De Gea in goal. Uh, Alley posted four shots in the box in that game. So that possibly bodes well for his, for his future prospects as an FPL asset. Obviously, Son is leaving now to go to the Asian Cup, and it looks like Harry Kane is going to be out for a couple of weeks. Nothing is confirmed yet, but it doesn't look great, uh, according to reports. I think he had a scan today, so hopefully we'll get results soon. But I would imagine it'll probably be later in the week before we uh, get a definite you know, call on Harry Kane's fitness. But in the absence of Son and Kane, you know, we could see Dele Alli step step up. He's, he's underperformed this season. I think he's only got four goals and two assists. Uh, he's missed games here or there with, with injury niggles and things as well but I've seen enough from him in that United game that would make me very interested in him if I was a if I was a son owner um, I would be considering the switch to Dele Alley uh, with those uh, Spurs fixtures looking really good so again he's he's a, he's a big differential he's less than 3% owned uh, and if he can find a bit of form over the next few weeks he, he would be a big help in, in climbing rankings another player I've added to the watch list this week is Samer Nasri at West Ham. Uh, I watched that Arsenal West Ham game as well at the weekend, and Nasri impressed me. He, he looked a lot sharper than I expected him to be for someone who hasn't played a lot of football over the last year or two. He's priced at just five point five million, so he's a he's he's budget friendly. He, he picked up the assist in that game for for Declan Rice. Um, great to see Declan Rice scoring his first goal as well, and and I've got my fingers crossed that he's gonna declare for Ireland in the in the next couple of weeks I know England and Ireland are fighting over him but hopefully we can we can hold on to him um, but back to Nasri yeah so Nasri got the assist there was another occasion as well where Felipe Anderson went close to scoring and that would have been a, another Nasri assist so he's heavily involved in the attack and play for West Ham he did get taken off after 70 minutes which is to be expected because you know it's going to take him a, a couple of weeks to get up to to get fully up to speed with the Premier League again, but again, West Ham's fixtures are look quite okay. Um, so again, Nasri straight onto my watch list, and I, and he could prove to be very good value between now and the end of the season. A couple of defenders now that I've added this week. Um, so I mentioned that I sold Alonso. 
just don't feel he's worth the money at the moment. Uh, it's a long time since he got attacking returns. Um, he'll probably go and score against Arsenal now, uh, knowing my luck this season. But his teammate David Luiz uh, caught my eye uh, when watching the highlights of that Chelsea game. I didn't watch the Chelsea game. It was just match of the day that I watched on that one. But again, Luiz stood out. I don't think I've ever owned David Luiz in FPL, but um, he's proven to be a good asset this season. 5.9 million. He's got two assists in the last three games. Um, I'm pretty sure both of those assists have come from uh, long long balls out of defence. Uh, so that's obviously something they're working on in, in training and, and it's coming to fruition now. Louise is always a goal threat as well from, from set pieces. He, he tends to get his head on a lot of corners and, and free kicks and things like that. And he, you know, he, he takes the odd free kick from distance as well. Now, I can't ever remember any of them finding the back of the net, but there's always potential there that he'll, he'll find a, the sweet spot and, and one will fly in the top corner soon. But... He is uh, Chelsea as well. Chelsea have ten um, ten clean sheets uh, in twenty two games, so they've got a pretty good clean sheet record this season. So David Luiz is on my watch list now. If if I go back to the Chelsea defence, it'll probably be to be to David Luiz rather than Marcus Alonso. Another defender who's been performing well in recent weeks: Saul Bamba at Cardiff. So Cardiff have racked up three clean sheets in their last four games, so that's that's caught my eye as well. Uh, Neil Warnock has, has got them churning out clean sheets. They're not scoring goals, but they're picking up clean sheets, which bodes well for the likes of Bamba, and, and Etheridge has been doing well in goal as well. He's been picking up points, and both of those players, Bamba and Etheridge, seem to be performing well in the, in the bonus point system as well. Uh, Bamba's got bonus points in two of those three clean sheets, so there's that, there's that added... Uh, added to his game as well in terms of FPL so Bamba has two goals already this season too so he is he's always a threat from from set pieces uh, his teammate Sean Morrison always you know he seems to be a bigger threat but Morrison hasn't found the back of the net yet for whatever reason so Bamba is someone if you're looking for a cheap defender around 4.5 million he's, he's definitely one to consider Two, two other players I've added now as well after watching match today. Uh, two Chelsea lads, Pedro and William. So as a Hazard captainer, I was watching match today and I was just thinking to myself, you know, where's Hazard? Um, I'd say he probably got about two touches on match of the day and, and that whatever five or six minute highlight reel. Uh, but he was just, he was nowhere to be seen really in that game. And it was Pedro and William that looked the most threatening. Um, they both scored a goal each. And they both seem to have have more chances to score as well, uh, aside from their goals. And, and looking at the stats to back that up, then Pedro and William both had three shots in the box in that game. Um, so could, we we may see them emerge now as as potential uh, FPL assets. You know, they're both very cheap, uh, both priced at around. I think William's about seven point two, and Pedro's probably even cheaper, um, possibly around six point five. I think he is. I haven't checked his price in a while, but both of those. Are on my watch list now. I'm I'm probably going to end up holding on to to Hazard, so I'm probably not going to be looking at a, a double up in the Chelsea midfield. But I think for anyone who doesn't have Hazard, uh, Pedro and William are worth keeping a close eye on. And um, there was a couple of comments Sari made as well recently about William. He was saying, you know, he he wants him to score more goals. And um, so maybe we'll see that between now and the end of the season. And Pedro's always a player I've liked. It's always been injury problems that have been his issue. Um, you know, he doesn't always play 90 minutes as well, which is not ideal. But definitely, definitely two I'm going to keep an eye on over the next couple of games. Moving on now to a couple of questions from Twitter. So I've noted down four here, four of the best ones that cover some of the main talking points this week. The first one came in from Marco Juvenin. He's asking, who are the best Man City assets right now? So I watched that, watched that Man City game last night. I didn't bother doing a, an eye test podcast for it because... You know, once once Bolly got sent off after twenty minutes, it was a bit of a training session. Then you know, there, there's not a lot you can really take from a game uh, like that where it's you know such a dominant team, eleven against ten. You know, possession was up at around eighty percent, I think, for most of that game. So there wasn't much to be learned from it from an FPL perspective. But again, when when I think of Man City, the two players that come to mind right away are Sterling and Sane. Uh, I still think they're the two best options. I've got Sane. Uh, and I'm quite happy to hold them. You know, uh, City have got two nice fixtures coming up. I think it's Huddersfield and Newcastle next. Uh, I think they're both away, but but both very good fixtures. So 
I would expect both of those two to score well in those. You know, there's always the worry that when Mendy comes back that it could affect um, Sané's minutes, but I'm not really going to worry about that until Mendy does return. Uh, Sterling is, I've, I've said it to a few people, Sterling's the ideal differential. He can score 20 plus points any given game week and he's only he's only owned by around 10%. So anyone who has Sterling, I'd be hanging on to him. Um, and if you can get to him easily, he's definitely someone to consider bringing in. So uh, th- the answer to the question, the best Man City assets I feel are still Sani and Sterling. Aguero feels risky now. Uh, Jesus got the start last night and scored another uh, another two goals. So, you know, that, that's backed up by his, I think he scored four in the cup game. So Jesus is bang in form. So Pep has the option of, you know, either Aguero or Jesus. So I've got absolutely no interest in bringing in Aguero because I just don't know if he's going to play every week. Um, defensively, I still don't really trust Man City. To me, they're a team, when they get attacked, they always look like conceding. Even against 10 men last night, there was a couple of occasions where Wolves probably should have scored uh, with a you know a better pass in the final third and things like that. So I don't really rate them defensively. Uh, I'm not looking to bring any other defenders or goalkeeper at the moment. KDB doesn't seem to be starting games. Whether there's some kind of issue there with Pep, we don't really know. Um, but again, I'm not not interested in him until I see him getting you know getting starts every week. I had David Silva on my watch list for a while, but I, I removed him this week because again he came off for just around the 60 minute mark I think last night. Um, so again, that's not ideal, and he's not really. You know, he's not getting involved in the attack and returns at the moment either. So, again, it's Sani or Sterling. I wouldn't look past those two. Um, and again, you know, those who doubled up on those two earlier in the season did very well. And, I mean, those who double up now could could, could do well again. The The next question came in from John Leong. Uh, he's asking about Harry Kane replacements. So, it looks like Harry Kane's going to be out. So, who do we replace him with? Um... I think there's three options. I've jotted down three options here. I think the most obvious one is Rashford if you don't have him. Uh, that's what I'll be looking to do this week. I think that's a no-brainer. You don't even need to think about that one. Rashford's uh, bang in form. You know, he's dirt cheap and, and he's got great fixtures. And, you know, his price is only going to go one way. So, you know, the sooner you get Rashford, the better. Another option for Kane, a Kane replacement is Aubameyang if you don't have him. I still rate Aubameyang very highly uh, despite his blank uh, against West Ham, you know, had a couple of chances in that game, but it just wasn't happening for Arsenal as a whole in that one. The fixtures are pretty tough. Um, off the top of my head, I think Aubameyang has Chelsea and Man City in the next three, so you know that might put people off. But I, I don't think that would put me off if I wanted to go Kane to Aubameyang. I still think he's uh, he's right up there as one of the best FPL assets this season, and I think we'll see him in the goals again uh, before long. So that's two options: you can go Rashford or you can go Aubameyang. And then a third option I've added in here is just going to a 4.5 million striker from Harry Kane and, and pumping your money into midfield and defence. Um, so I brought in Kamara last week from Fulham, uh, 4.5 million. And again, with my luck this season, it looks like he could be on his way out of the club now. There's rumours that there's rumors that Kamara and Mitrovic had, a, had a, an argument or a row during a team yoga session. Now... While you're doing yoga, but you know, trust Mitrovic to do so. Um, Mitrovic, Mitrovic would probably fight with his own shadow. To be fair, so there's probably is no surprise in that. But it was, you know, it was telling that Kamara wasn't in the 18 at the weekend. So it looks like he'll be the one that may be shipped out of the club. You know, if there is an issue there. Um, so again, that's probably going to be a problem for me, as as you know, I'm going to have another dud on my bench. I've already got Balbuena problems. Now I've got Kamara problems, and now I've also got Trent problems. So problems are just building up for me. Uh, I've got that little voice in the back of my head saying wild card, wild card, wild card. But no, I'm just going to hold off. I think it's better to hold off on that until later in the season. But yeah, so that's the options. I would go, ra- go Kane to Rashford, Kane to Bamiang, or Kane right down to a cheap striker and, and use the money to invest in midfield. Even some, like, I've seen some people mention Colin Quanner at Huddersfield, he's only 4.3 million, he's playing in the championship now, um, so you know, you're never going to, you're not never going to get any points from him, but if you're happy to use him as a third sub, just to free up as much cash as possible, that is another option to think about. 
The next question came in from David Gibson. His question was, at what point do the blanks and doubles start playing a role in your transfer plans? So we, we've got a little bit of information now about blanks and doubles. It's starting to filter through, but we really don't have enough to start making you know, long-term plans. So for me, I always wait until there is more information uh, before I really start thinking about them. I know some people are already um, planning them. Uh, planning for them and starting to think of strategies but I, I really I'll be waiting probably until next week until after the cup games until we know when or at least which teams are going to have doubles and which are going to have blanks um, the main thing to do for now is to follow Ben Crell on Twitter he'll keep you right with all things blanks and doubles and another podcast I want to flag up as well I listened to it last week uh, the Planet FPL podcast from last week was was very good they touched on uh, a possible chip strategy and um, it, it's worth listening to that one. Yeah, I think it's episode 38, if I remember correctly. So check that out if you want to start thinking you know, more about blanks and double game weeks. I will talk a lot more about them in common podcasts once we have you know, a lot more information about them. So they won't be factoring in my transfer decisions this week. Um, I, actually, I actually wrote a piece this week for uh, 90 minutes at a time. So they released their first digital FPL um, publication in December. And issue two is due to be released, I think it's this, uh, this Thursday or Friday. So keep an eye out for that. I, I've done a piece on, on uh, chips and, and blank and double gaming strategy in that one. It's more so about what I've done in the past and you know my early thoughts on what I'm going to do this season. The last Twitter question I'll tackle is from Mina Mina Gerges. Who is the best sun replacement? So again, a lot of people are looking for cane replacements. People are looking for sun replacements. So I've just had I've just brought up my watch list in front of me, and I'm just going to call out a few of the possible sun replacements. Um, I think the most obvious one, if you don't have him, is Paul Pogba. Um, I think he's a no-brainer now under Solskjaer. The way he's playing, he he passed the eye test again against uh, Tottenham. You know, he burst into the box far more regularly now than he was doing under Mourinho. Um, he probably, sh- you know, he was unlucky not to get a bigger haul at the weekend. Lloris made one very good save to, to tip one over the bar. Pogba, I'm pretty sure, had five shots on target in that game. And that was more than any other midfielder uh, across the game week. So he's backing up the stats. He's passing the eye test. And he's he's a very good price with great fixtures. So Pogba's a no-brainer from Sun if you don't have Pogba. Another one who I already mentioned was Deli Alley. If you've got a if you've got a bit of extra change lying around, uh, I would consider Son to Deli Alley. Ericsson's one to consider as well, but but I just I probably just favour Deli Alley at the moment, going on what I've seen in that United game. Felipe Anderson is another player I still like. You know, people who own them are probably losing patience. I think it's four blanks in the last five. But again, every time I watch him, he looks good. He was very close to getting on the score sheet uh, against Arsenal. Uh, it was a long-range effort that trickled by the post. And there was a couple of occasions too where he broke forward and it was just bad decisions in the final third that let him down. Um, but again, son to Felipe Anderson is, is one to think about if you don't own him. I still think he'll get more FPL points this season. And his teammate again, Nasri. If you want to downgrade son, uh, Nasri's one to think about as well. So there's four options for uh, replacements for Hyung Min Son. Moving on now to game week 23, going to talk about captaincy and transfers. So captaincy, first of all, it's a it's an easy one this week. It's going to be Mo Salah for most people, I would imagine, at home to Crystal Palace, given his form. So I'm planning to bring Salah in and give him the armband, not just this week, probably for the next four weeks. Um, Paul Pogba would slightly tempt me uh, against um, it's Burnley, I think, United have this weekend. Or, no, Brighton, sorry. Pogba, Rashford, you know, people will be tempted to captain those, given United's form. Um, but for me, it's there's no contest when it, when you compare them to Mo Salah. Arsenal are playing Chelsea, so that's probably going to put people off the likes of Aubameyang and Hazard. Um, if Harry Kane was fit, he'd be a great option against Fulham, but it doesn't look like he's going to be, so that obviously rules him out. Man City are away to Huddersfield, so again, the likes of Sterling and Sané will be in people's slots, but I think Mo Salah is... He's probably going to have a higher captaincy percentage than anyone all season uh, in game week 23, I would imagine. So it's going to take a brave manager to go against him. Moving on now to my transfers. So 
everything's up a bit up in the air now after this disastrous Alexander Arnold news. Uh, so I, I've I've have I've got two free transfers. I've already used one to bring in the crocked TAA. My plans, uh, my the my plans for my other transfers was I I was planning to take a minus four this week. So uh, once Kane is confirmed out, I was going to get Rashford in, and then I was going to use the cash save to do Pereira, who's been an absolute disaster for me to bring in Salah. So you know, on paper, I was looking at TAA Rashford and Salah coming into my side this week, and Salah captain. And I was feeling you know really good about things. Team is starting to look a lot better than it has done in the in the last couple of weeks. But now obviously Trent weakens things again, which is very frustrating. So with those moves, I'll be probably keeping Hazard, but I won't be captaining him again. Uh, he's he's caused me too much pain, and it'll be auto captain Salah as I said for the next couple of weeks. So. With those moves, you know, I've been burned this week already by a, by an early transfer. You know, it was probably one of the first early transfers I've made since the, the first part of the season. I always preach patience, um, you know, and I haven't haven't um, followed my own advice this week. So I only have myself to blame for that. And it's a lesson, you know. Another thing about the Trent injury is, you know, I didn't watch the Liverpool game uh, at the weekend. It was a three o'clock kickoff, so it wasn't on TV in the UK. And... I think Trent had issues in the warm up, so that that should have been warning signs for me. But you know, I did see tweets about that on Saturday, but I forgot about them then. And you know, I was out and about Saturday night. I was out till about two a.m. Saturday night. Um, Sunday then I was out and about again. Um, and, and I came home and I just once I seen the Chelsea result, and and you know, no clean sheet for Alonso. I just did a rage transfer. It was about nine o'clock on Sunday evening. I did that transfer. So again, it's it's just a lesson for myself. Um, don't make rage transfers. And it goes back to the eye test as well. You know, if I was able to watch that Liverpool game and, and you know see that Trent was a, was a, was had problems in the warm up, and people are telling me that he was wearing strapping in that game and he was taking painkillers, you know, maybe if I had known that or seen that, I might not have made the move early. So again, the eye test is always very very important. I feel, um, and it's probably stung me this week by not being able to watch that game and. I didn't watch match of the day until Monday as well. So I had already made that transfer before I watched match of the day. So I wouldn't have been able to pick it up there either. But again, no excuses. Take it on the chin. It's my own fault. Lesson learned. Uh, and hopefully it won't cause me too much damage. I'm asking myself the question now. Should I should I sell Alexander-Arnold for another minus four, which would make it a minus eight this week? Now, I never like taking minus fours for defenders. Um, it's different though if they're injured and they're going to get zero points. Um, so I will be considering it. It's it's who to bring in. I haven't really looked at the options yet. You know, there's the likes of uh, Lukadinha. You know, a player. Those kind of players, Holabas. These kind of players who could come in and get you. You know, big holes, and it's worth it then. But on the other hand, I could just play uh, the special one, and hopefully that he can get you know two or three points against uh, Liverpool, and then you know to to to. to avoid having to, to, to do a minus eight but again i'll think a, a lot more about that t- uh, towards the end of the week uh, whether to take another minus four to get rid of alexander arnold or not so that's things covered for game week uh 23 the a couple of points before i finish up the only eye test pod i did in game week 22 was for the arsenal uh, west ham game so you'll find that on in all the regular regular places as well wherever you listen to your podcast um I watched United Spurs. I wasn't at home to do a an eye test podcast for that one, but I did put a tweet up about it with a few thoughts. And again, I watched Man City last night, but there was no point really doing an eye test pod because it was it was a training session for City, uh, as I say. But but hopefully this weekend coming, um, I'll I'll be doing more than one eye test podcast this weekend. Uh, thanks again to everyone who signed up to Patreon since last week's podcast had a had a big number of signups uh, last week, probably a record breaking week. So thanks to those. Anyone who's interested in my joining my Slack channel, joining my WhatsApp one to one, or my WhatsApp group chat, um, check out the link to my Patreon page, which is in my Twitter bio. Um, I do live streams every Friday for patrons. We did one last Friday; uh, it was about an hour long. I'll be doing another one this Friday. And every week as well on Patreon, I do a, a game week review, which is available at all pledge levels. So I did that today. Uh, it includes stats uh, from the, the game week, some of my thoughts uh, and my plans going forward as well. So any questions about Patreon, just send me a, a DM on Twitter. That's the easiest place to get me. Thanks as always for listening. 
Hopefully I didn't sound too downbeat after that terrible Trent news. Um, and I'll be back next Tuesday with, with episode 25. So good luck. Good luck in Game Week 23, folks.